if the floor can hear me, they got some great merch as well. There's Uncle Dane jumping into the screen. So last month I went to a competitive TF2 LAN at the Esports Arena in Santa Ana, California, where I got to meet a bunch of fellow TF2 fans and community figureheads, experienced the most rain I've seen in California in a decade, and hung out with my TF crew buddies. It was an awesome event, definitely one of the most legit setups for a competitive TF2 tournament I've ever seen, and I'm excited to see the comp scene expand even further in the future. Almost immediately after Froyo Tech took home the first prize, I hopped on a plane to Bellevue, Washington, along with Agro, the host of Critzcast TF2 podcast, and Julander, high profile trader slash collector and fellow TF crew member. We also met up with Pazer, a good friend of mine and sustainer of a very useful spectator plugin for competitive Team Fortress 2 broadcasting. The whole reason for traveling up to Washington was to take a tour of Valve, which was organized by Agro via one of his longtime friends, Heather Campbell, who works as an artist on the TF2 comics and was willing to show us around their offices. Agro was kind enough to offer us to be added to the tour as plus ones, and of course, I just could not pass up on that opportunity. So what happened in there? Well, I, I saw a lot of really cool stuff, but of course, I was mainly interested in meeting the Team Fortress 2 development team, so I'll just skip to that part of the tour. As far as I know, the Team Fortress team had no idea that I was coming, nor did I have any suspicion that they even knew exactly who I was, since I never introduced myself as Uncle Dane the NG main, you know, the guy from YouTube, do you know who I am? No, I, I intended to visit them not as a TF2 YouTuber, but simply as a fan of their game, so I introduced myself as such. Uh, the first thing I saw when I walked into the TF team's office was that every single one of the people using a computer was playing Team Fortress 2, which to me was, of course, unexpected. A while ago, I made a video basically calling out the TF team on my suspicions that they don't even play their own game at all, that they just work on pushing out updates and fixing bugs, and that's as far as their involvement in Team Fortress 2 goes. Right away, I felt like my theory was already proven wrong. And keep in mind that unlike every other community figurehead that has visited Valve in the past, that they had no idea that I specifically was going to be walking into their office, so I can't even really pin down a theory that they had planned on firing up the game that one time to try and prove me wrong. No, it turns out that I was just straight up wrong. The TF team does play their game, apparently often enough to where just my semi-random appearance happened to interfere with their playtesting sessions. So anyway, after peeking in on what they were playing, uh, they were all on a jungle-themed map that none of us had ever seen before. Oh my god, jungle update hype. Uh, we left them alone to finish their playtest to continue the rest of the tour. Before we walked out, though, uh, one of the developers in the back noticed us and said that we should come back after they're done, and then we can formally meet. So about a half an hour later, we swung back around and we met with the developer who had invited us back, Eric Smith, one of the main developers of Team Fortress 2. He then introduced us to Jill, another very prolific developer, and we basically told them both how much we like Team Fortress 2 and thanked them for their work. Eric then told us that we should go check out the VR station out in the lobby and try out the Vive if we haven't already. So we said goodbye to Eric and Jill and we left their offices. Right there, I thought that that was going to be the end of our meeting with the TF team, but as we were getting ready to play the Vive in the lobby area, Jill actually walked out and basically just started hanging out with us. So for the next 45 minutes or so, all four of us took turns asking Jill questions and listening to stories about the development process for Team Fortress 2. He said a lot of things that we already know, confirmed a lot of things that we had suspicions about but technically didn't know, and a few things that nobody has known about and I personally wouldn't feel comfortable leaking. But don't worry, the secrets I am keeping from the community are not nearly as cool as you might expect them to be. I'm not harboring them for no reason. I just want to refrain from spilling the beans because these are things that are not 100% confirmed and I don't want to start a hype train for something that might not even happen anytime soon. Anyway, uh, I'm just going to list off some of the more interesting things that I learned while talking with Jill. First things first, the number of people on the Team Fortress 2 development team. If you guys followed some of the things that was said in the recent Gabe Newell AMA on Reddit, you'll know that Driller, one of the developers of the Team Fortress team, said that the current number of developers is 16, which includes programmers, artists, writers, level designers, and sound engineers. Now, when people ask how many people are on the TF2 dev team, I think what people really really want to know is how many of them are programmers, because while the artists and writers are certainly an important part of the development team for any game, these people aren't responsible for how the game plays. The sound engineer who works on TF2 doesn't have any say in how the pyro update is going to turn out, you know? By the way, before anyone asks, I didn't ask any questions about the pyro update. I was pretty confident early on that I wouldn't get any complete breakdowns for their plans or anything like that, so I decided not to waste my time with that subject in particular. Anyway, I just decided to ask Jill straight up how many game programmers are specifically working on Team Fortress 2 right now, and he said that the answer can vary depending on how you define the word programmer, but he said that the number is about four to five programmers, with the rest being those artists, writers, level designers, and sound engineers that Driller was talking about. This number to me isn't too surprising because it 
explains the speed and quality of the updates as of late. So I asked the obvious follow-up question, why doesn't Valve just hire more programmers to work on the Team Fortress 2 team? Well, Jill explained that quite simply, that's just not up to them. Hiring people is something that is done outside of their station and ultimately is up to the hiring departments at Valve and not something that can be done from within the TF team. And even if the TF team were to request to the higher-ups that Valve hire more programmers to help them with Team Fortress 2 and actually got that request filled, the other dev teams would see that and demand that they also get more developers hired for their teams. In other words, it's a mix of intercompany politics, conflicts of interest, and generally just Valve's stingy hiring policies. Valve hardly ever hires new employees as it is, let alone specifically for the Team Fortress 2 development team. So as it stands, the low number of people working on the TF team right now is mostly just an unfortunate consequence of the way Valve works as a company. And in my opinion, the number one reason for why Team Fortress 2 updates are so few and far between. There simply isn't enough people working on the game right now to justify expecting full development team updates. And while Valve is, as a whole, certainly to blame for this situation, placing the slow development blame on the TF team themselves does seem very unfair to me, because it's very clear when talking to them in person that they do care about the game very much, and know a lot more about Team Fortress than they appear to from the silly mistakes that they've made in the past. When I was talking to Jill the entire time, it felt very much like I was talking to just another member of the Team Fortress 2 community. I didn't have to explain anything to him, I didn't have to give any backstory to the reasoning behind any of my questions. He knew a lot about the community and the reactions to things that they've done. He even admitted multiple times that they pushed out Meet Your Match way too early and is completely aware that the launch was not fleshed out. To put it lightly, I was humbled by how aware Jill seemed to be regarding community feedback and I think that it's important to keep in mind that they do lurk and listen even though it's never that clear since communication is hardly ever reciprocated back at us. Anyway, moving on, but still semi-related, Pazer asked about porting Team Fortress 2 to Source 2, which Jill responded that it would be nice, but the amount of work that would take would require much more manpower than the TF team currently possesses by far. Jewlander asked about any of the solutions that the TF team might have for the problem of this steady degradation of the worth of craftable weapons and metal, more commonly known as the rise in key prices. Jill mentioned that they have considered adding a metal sink to the game, but have found it very difficult to implement a system that would not be taken advantage of. In particular, he mentioned the reoccurring problem of bots that people already use to slowly obtain free metal and told us about a specific instance very recently where he had to personally ban over 200,000 bot accounts. We were all very impressed by this before he told us that the troublemakers simply just made 200,000 more accounts a few days later. So it kind of puts into perspective how problematic the people who are completely willing to take advantage of the free economy that Team Fortress 2 offers and how difficult it might be to implement a metal sink system that would prevent that kind of thing from happening. In other words, suddenly increasing the worth of metal and items in a free-to-play game would only increase the amount of fake accounts and bots that only are there to make money and game the system. So it's not exactly an issue that can be solved overnight. The important thing to take away here, however, is that they are aware of the issue, so who knows, maybe they'll figure it out someday. Some good news that I got when I asked about it specifically is that they plan on raising the level cap in casual mode. In fact, they plan on doing so along with the next big campaign update. Jill mentioned that they have the level badges set up so they can just add new colors and have 150 or so more levels added there every few months. Along with this conversation about casual mode, I asked pretty much the only question that I knew beforehand that I wanted to ask them, and that was if bridging the gap between casual and competitive players is a priority. And Jill's answer was a very passionate yes. He seemed to share this philosophy with me that making competitive mode and casual mode more similar is very important for the growth of the game, but without removing the carefree aspect of PUBTF2 that's always been so integrated into the culture of the game. The thing is, however, that they admittedly don't know how to approach that solution just yet. From what I gathered from the conversation on the topic, it sounded like they are completely open to just testing stuff out, such as rotating different maps and game modes in and out of the competitive mode, which we've already seen a few times, and possibly in the future even a completely different competitive mode setup based on what they think might work best for everyone, including placement matches, more fine-tuned ranking systems, things like that. What's important to note is that they are trying very hard to be careful not to alienate any specific sub-community of TF2. Jill specifically mentioned how some people enjoy just being friendly, and while he personally doesn't understand that appeal, those people are still considered players and they want to make sure that they do still have a place to do whatever they want, just as much as other players who enjoy the basic casual experience and the players who enjoy a full-on competitive experience. But what does that mean for competitive mode? Well, competitive mode is currently 6v6 with no class limits and only features certain maps, but that doesn't mean that it will stay that way. The TF team has held off investing money in a tournament, even though they are very interested in doing so, because they are still not confident with the competitive mode format. 
at least not enough to say this is our official competitive Team Fortress 2, because if they were to announce a TF2 Majors with the current rule set and format, that would be basically setting in stone what they consider to be competitive TF2, and right now, it just is not exactly what they want it to be. Specifically, they don't want to shut out specialist classes from the majority of competitive play. This is good news to me, of course, because I personally am not a fan of the lack of class limits in competitive mode, nor the very small map pool, especially with the prominence of 5 CP maps, so. And then a few extra things to mention that came up in conversation was that while a lot of the feedback from Reddit and the Steam forums was generally pretty negative regarding the Meet Your Match update, after the implementation of the Give Feedback surveys, the results from those polls have always been above neutral, uh, contrary to what might be expected, and while those surveys don't seem to serve much purpose due to how vague the options are, the TF team does receive hidden detailed metrics from those results. For instance, some maps tend to have more negative feedback than others. Um, an interesting story about Powerhouse, uh, of all the things that came up when we were talking about the new jungle-themed map, is that apparently Powerhouse was originally intended to be released with TF2's launch back in 2007, but it was never finished by its creator. Fast forward to 2015, and according to Jill, the original creator of Powerhouse, who had gone off and worked on other games up until that point, just decided one day to roll his desk back into the TM Fortress 2 office and finish the map. Uh, this story is entertaining to me for two reasons, so one being that it makes total sense since Powerhouse aesthetically looks a lot like early maps such as Hydro, and also tends to stalemate a lot like Dust Bowl. Secondly, the way the map was handled and released over the course of almost eight years is a pretty decent demonstration of how Valve works as a company. It's obvious that pretty much anyone at any time can just decide to drop projects and then pick them up again. In this instance, almost a full decade later, just because they feel like it crazy. And the last thing to mention, which I personally think is one of the best pieces of information I got while visiting with the TF team, is that they are currently working on making the overall matchmaking and party system UI work outside of just that little matchmaking screen. From what I gathered, it would probably end up being pretty similar to how Overwatch's matchmaking UI works, where you can queue up for a match and then explore the menus while you wait. Jill even mentioned that it might even be possible to play in a different server while you wait to be put into an official match. I think this would make the experience much much more fluid and would make people feel like they're not waiting as long since they can fill the time with organizing their backpacks, crafting, or maybe even warming up on a jump map. So those are pretty much all the things that I learned about what is expected to come from the small but hardworking developers on the TF team while I visited Valve last month. And to be honest, I expected to have a changed mind about the TF team when I walked out, just like how everyone who goes to Valve seems to come back with tales of what's to come and sort of this seemingly unwarranted optimism. But the thing is, I don't think my mind has changed much about Valve. Uh, for a while, I had suspicions that the TF team only worked on the game because they felt like they had to, but that's the only real negative thing that I had suspected before meeting them in person. Turns out, I was wrong. The TF2 developers really do love the game. They play it often, and they listen to the community a lot more than we'd expect them to. The main weakness that they have is that there just isn't enough of them. And my original suggestion for the solution to this problem had always seemed so obvious, just hire more people or give the game to a larger team of developers, but the thing is, that's just not how it works. It's much, much easier said than done, especially with the way that Valve works as a company, and even how hiring one person just doesn't happen overnight, let alone enough developers to make a dent in the workload that they have on their desks. People often criticize the TF2 team for leaning on the community for a lot of new content, but to be honest, it only makes sense. Developing a game of tf 2 size and audience is not a three to five person job, so of course they're gonna have to cut corners. Of course, I wish it didn't have to be this way, but it's just an unfortunate situation that is a result of the fact that Valve is not a game company. They make all sorts of stuff. They created Steam. They're developing a virtual reality console as well as films now. Gabe Newell himself has gone on record as saying that they consider their game titles more as tools to develop new ways of doing new and innovative things rather than just products. So maybe if they get around to working on something that would be best applied to a first-person shooter or a team-based multiplayer game, TF2 might get more attention then, but that's just a theory. A Dane theory. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for watching and listening to my story about my Valve visit. I'm sorry I don't have any news on the Pyro update or if they plan on making the Bison work correctly again. Once more, I honestly didn't expect to get any more information about that stuff, so I didn't ask. In the meantime, I suppose I can take this time to mention a few things. Uh, my sponsor, Marketplace.tf, cheaper than the Steam Marketplace. If you want to get some items for real world money that are instantly tradable and easy to find, just head on over there and check them out. And don't forget to use my offer code UNCLE at checkout when you buy keys because you can get one for free when you buy 
buy 10 of them, it's pretty good. Also, I wanna plug some stuff that I don't really plug here too often. I have a public Discord server, a lot of friendly nieces and nephews in there if you ever wanna hang out and chat about stuff. I have a Twitter account that I use a lot. I think I post something on there at least like once or twice a day, mostly just bad jokes and updates and memes and stuff. Uh, if you don't like money and wanna give me some of it, I have a pretty simple Patreon campaign. $1 a month and I'll add you on Snapchat. $5 a month and I'll also sign an in-game item of yours, completely optional, but of course, greatly appreciated if you decide to support my living and breathing habits. I'm gonna be streaming on Twitch every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday during the day, starting like next month or something. I don't know, soon. So just make sure you go and follow me on there. I also am working on a podcast, so look out for that here pretty soon. Uh, I think that's all I got for now. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you nieces and nephews next time. Bye-bye.